Rebel Junior's uh, top six. Uh, Liam Lawson, Liam yeah. Lawson, Liam Lawson, <laughs> Liam Lawson, Liam Lawson, <laughs> Liam Lawson. You know, it's, it's a complete guessing game, you know, at the end of the day. Um, that is what a preview generally is, mate. Come on. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is a little bit, isn't it? Just a little bit. Couldn't that be um, the intro? <laughs> so, 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 Please, can that be the intro? For God's sake, you guys are going to be the death of me, I swear. <laughs> Hello everyone and get this, welcome to race week. We've had a fun off season with Fromex and Frox or TRSs or whatever you want to call them, but this week is the biggie. It's Formula 2 and Formula 3 kicking off their 2023 seasons. Welcome to the Feeder Series podcast. I'm your host Jim Kimberley and it's crazy that almost a year ago to the day we were previewing the 2022 F2 season. Since then, we've had 44 more podcasts, 2,000 YouTube subscribers, a 4.9 star rating on Spotify, and several more appearances from both of the people joining me today to preview F2 2023. First up, and for the second week in a row, surprisingly, is the man who a year ago described himself as a loudmouth malcontent, and sounds like the ideal guest for our podcast, really. And... It was New Zealand chat last week, F2 chat this week. Could life get any better for Josh Revel? Welcome to the podcast. Could life get any better? Um, maybe. Potentially if some people were not on that Formula 2 grid, but uh, all in good time. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Thanks for coming back, Josh. Uh, we had the season preview last year, the season review last year. Tyler, you only joined us for the review and on a very last minute effort, you've now joined us for the preview for 2023. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for helping us out a little bit. You and Josh seem to get on pretty damn well with your uh, with your review last year, but predictions this year, what are you thinking? I mean, I'm in my pajamas, so I feel like I have actually been dragged out of bed and it's, <laughs> it's now 2.25 in the morning. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm actually really excited. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, I thought that after last year, I was going to be a bit like, oh, another F2 season. What if it's as disappointing as last year's one? And as the grid developed, as it, as it filled up, I got more and more excited. And I was kind of counting down the day to chat to Josh about it. I was disappointed to hear that I wasn't going to do it. And ultimately, you know, I was I was sort of like sat there with my predictions on my own, just thinking, oh, okay, is this what it's going to be then? This is my my season build up is, but I'm back, and not that people are going to care as much as having Josh on, but I'm really excited to go over 22, you know, drivers in what is, in my opinion, the best junior single seater series in the world. Well, I will give a little bit of context. Uh, you might have watched or listened last week, and we did tease the possibility of a dream guest. Now, Josh Revel. This was Josh Revel's dream guest. I will, uh, I will highlight. Josh Revel does like Tyler, I believe, but dream guest might be a stretch too far. We had some unfortunate news, which I think Josh replied with about sixty O's in his no capitalized in his message when I broke the news that that guest is unable to join this week. That was a Darth Vader Revenge of the <laughs> Sith. No, <laughs> it was just the most dramatic. No, like why? <laughs> Hopefully, we will get this guest on uh, in the future. They seem to promise that we'd figure something out, and Josh will pull you back in for that to discuss everything. But but we will we will make it work, Darth Vader or not. Now, before we get started in earnest, if you haven't listened to or watched the podcast before, please like, comment, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a rating review if you are listening on Spotify. We've had Josh Revel on multiple times. He'll be back on later this year. We also have F2, F3, Freca drivers, everything in feeder series. We do our best to make sure you guys are fully informed on everything that's going on in the feeder series world. On Spotify, we have a 4.9 star rating. We've got over 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. You can leave a rating on Spotify, review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like, comment, and subscribe, as I've already said, on the YouTube channel. This episode has a few technical 
glitches, I'll call them. Try and edit them out the best I can, but if you do have any audio or visual issues that you see, I do apologize for that. Finally, we now have over 300 drivers on our Discord. You can check out the link in the description or the podcast show notes to join our Discord channel and speak with 300 real life drivers. And finally, as we go into the season, the frequency of the podcast should be a little bit better. So please do keep a lookout every Wednesday for when the podcast does come out. So the podcast this week, as people probably have ascertained, and in all likelihood, you might not be watching before F2 starts. So when I say this week, it's just whenever you're watching or listening. It's solely about Formula 2. We've got to the point of the year at last that Formula 2 and Formula 3 is starting. Formula 2 is our focus today. Tyler, you are F2 editor, and you also have been keeping up to date and putting articles out on feeder series that... Yep. FT testing happened. Um, we've got a solid lineup. I know you appeared on Transfer Weekly with the excellent Chris McCarthy to talk through a bit of a preview. But just before we get started and go through each of the teams, so if you are joining us for the first time, we're going to go through each of the teams and assess their chances with their drivers. And in before- what way are we going to go through them? Uh, that, uh, we are going to go through them alphabetically. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're going to start with VRT, end up with Virtuosi. So we're going to have some of the heavyweight hitters at the start of the end of the podcast to keep you guys interested. But before we do get to that, Tyler, testing, what takeaways have you got if people didn't watch Transfer Weekly? What are you thinking is likely for this uh, season, this upcoming season, based off testing? Well, honestly, last year I paid a lot of attention to testing for 2022, this is. And I remember thinking, Carlin looked really quick. And then they were quick, but they still finished behind MP Motorsport, which really came as a shock to me. Um, So I decided to obviously investigate into testing. And what I found was it's really, really difficult to even know who's on top at the moment because we saw um, Richard Vashore in the Van Amersfoort, which I thought was quite quite quick last year. They were ridiculous in testing, um, which makes you think, can a team like VAR compete for podiums on a consistent basis um you know Doohan was pretty quiet by his own standards uh Porsche looked you know decent and strong we saw a lot of a lot of the new guys Leclerc picking up really quickly Awasa looking good as, as as he was last year with Dams so to be honest if if anything it just makes it, sh- it shows how competitive the season's going to be I think that was what I picked up from testing it's just that any mistake you'll get punished this year for sure it is a solid solid grid um Josh, I think we slightly touched on it when you were talking about New Zealand and stuff last week, just with talking FT, it might have been before we even got the, the podcast started to record. Your thoughts on a whole about the upcoming championship season? Uh, likewise, I don't think there's any really sort of real favourite this year. I think, you know, people will look towards Taya Porsche because there's a lot of hype about him getting that um, Salba seat for you know, for the last couple of years now. Um, but then MP have got their resources Ooh. together. They're really on a good roll, you know. Um, and they've now got the Prima lineup from last year and Hauger's uh, a good talent. Darabal's got good racecraft, although I'm not quite sure what he's still doing there. Um, dams provide rocket ships. Um, now they'll have two competent drivers instead of just one. <laughs> um Carlin will have, you know, two Ripple Juniors and you know, two who are highly touted. Like you go up and down this grid. There's a lot of potential. And there's also PHM. But you know, really, you can't really nut down any particular sort of favorite hitting into this year. And again, you look at testing, it's like it's not a hell of a lot you can sort of decipher from that apart from well, this person may be quick, that person may be quick, but again, you get to the real season and it could be turned on its head. So, I don't know. It's all a bit of a guessing game right now as to who's going to be where. Last thing before we properly get into it, and again, it was slightly discussed on Transfer Weekly, the rookies, the the graduates from Formula 3 as a whole, it's every year is a bit of a change in, of the guard. But I feel this year in particular is a significant change in the guard. Tyler, you said it was top seven, I think, that are making the step up from Formula 3 
to Formula Two this year? Any of those guys, I mean, yeah, particularly I mean, shining? I mean, I mean, you know, in 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 one way, all of them. I mean, you look down the list: the champion Victor Martins, Zayn Maloney, three consecutive feature race podium, uh, feature race victories, I should say, to finish the year off. Oliver Behrman. You know, 17 years old, Ferrari Driver Academy, English. It's a bit of a weird mix, but he's just quality. Isaac Hajar, you know, a rookie who realistically should have won the title if it wasn't for a really poor qualifying where he binned it in the gravel in, in Monza. Roman Stanek took him three years to get up there, but fifth in F3 is no easy feat. Leclerc, I mean, people have, have their reservations about him, but I think one thing's for sure is that he's going to be an interesting one to watch in F2. And then Crawford, who even Crawford was able to pick up victories and podiums um, and make that progression so yeah there's a massive change I mean statistically I think this is also the season with the most F1 drivers uh, or sorry sorry F1 drivers drivers uh, within F1 academies okay future boy with the F1 drivers there but no in time that's a lot of F1 drivers <laughs> from the but yeah no, what I'm trying to say is that statistically this season has what you'd expect in terms of quality um, and Despite the fact that there's a lot of young, really young drivers, guys like Hajar and and um, Behrman and Crawford, it is really exciting because of the fact that I think this year the inexperience is going to matter a bit less. So that could provide amazingness in every single way. So yeah, um, it is a bit of a shift, and we've seen guys like Vips and Lawson, Armstrong. You know, some of the guys who we kind of expected to be in F1, you know, three, four, five years ago. And they've now moved on, not quite made it. And you know, you've got these new guys who, you know, as I said, they're all F1 junior team related. So someone's got to fail, really. <laughs> wow, that's that's quite the preview there. Someone's got to fail. Um, Josh, anything you want to add to that? Or do you want to get started on, on ART? I think we can get started on these ART. guys. Let's go. Now, I don't have any particular notes. Um, this is particularly unplanned, as people watching won't know, but Tyler and Josh definitely do. The plan pretty much is going through alphabetical order, and that means we're starting with ART, whose two drivers this year both highly rated. It's all French, 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 French. This is French as Alpine this year. Theo Porcher, Victor Martin. Porcher coming in third season. Uh, some people consider a favourite. Victor Martin coming in as the F3 champion, very highly rated. Both of them part of F1 academies. Now, I don't know. Well, I'm going to find out what you guys think, but I don't know if Theo Porsche is going to be the champion at the end of this year. People said this last year that he was the shoe in for the champion. It seems to have somewhat slipped down people's pecking order. So, Josh Revel, I think you might have even called him the your your call for the champion. Surprisingly, he didn't choose Drogovic last year. What do you think of Theo Pusher, Victor Martin, and ART for 2023? Two French drivers and a French team with a French engine. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, but, you know, realistically here, you know, we know ART are a solid outfit. We know Theo Pusher is a solid driver. Um, showed promise in testing, for sure. Um, two things derailed him last year. The damn engine kept on blowing up. The, the amount of uh, stuff he... I'm not saying it cost him the championship, but the amount of times it happened was just unacceptable, you know? And I think reliability was to a point where Marino Sato said that he was like, it's like his seventh or eighth engine by Red Bull Ring. It's just like, that's crazy. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, old wives' tales and all that kind of stuff. Is this the part of the podcast you know, where we just slam on, on Mechachrome? Oh, no, 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 not at all. What makes you think I would hate on Mechachrome? That, is that later I've, on? In the I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a point where I don't mind. I've already pissed it away. Like My, my relationship with uh, with that championship is long gone. Let's just let's just highlight feeder series and Josh Revel's perspectives do not necessarily align. No, no, no. I am my own person. Right? These guys... Uh, telling the truth, I'm just spreading lies and hearsay. So anyway, let's getting back on point. We're here with Taylor Porsche. Straight up, I'm calling it now. He's going to be the champion this year. Why? Vibes. But you know, he is he is putting in you know st strong performances all the time, having good testing. 
The car looks like a championship car this year for mm-hmm. sure. Hopefully it keeps on you know, moving in the races and doesn't just sit in a pile of its own smoke in the side of the track like it just did all the time last year. But it's not all just down to the engine, like I said before. The other thing that derailed his championship campaign last year was inconsistent qualifying. You know, it's all very well and good having good race craft and good speed and all that stuff. But when he's half the time up toward the front and the other half down toward the back, it doesn't help you. You know, especially like Zanvor. You can't, at a track like Zanvor, where it's just not big enough for bicycles, let alone F2 cars, you can't qualify down the pack like he did. Because as you can see, your championship rival wins uh, wins the race while you're struggling to pass for 14th, 13th place. You know, so he does need to be a bit more consistent in qualifying in that regard, from what I remember. But, you know... As we've seen before in other championships, the big thing has been consistency. Um, you know, in every every title campaign. So if he can nut that down, he's got the pace. ART's a strong enough outfit, he could do it. Martin's brilliant driver. Uh he'll be he'll be there or thereabouts, but I'm not certain he can challenge Porsche in the first year of F2. It's a, it's a really tough thing. To win out of the box in F2, unless you have everything going for you. But I'm expecting one or two race wins from him this season. So, yeah, top six is top six as well in the championship. Before I go to Tyler and say top six of the championship and champion, ART championship winning team? No. Interesting. Well, I'll get on to them in a sec. Okay, okay. Tyler, Tyler Foster, your thoughts on what is a solid driver lineup, in my opinion? Oh yeah, they they certainly have. You could arguably say the best driver lineup on the grid. Um, yeah. I think that I don't share um, Josh's feelings for Porsche winning the title on the basis that I get the feeling he's slightly cursed. Um, <laughs> he like he's just carrying that X, and if you go into the season with this sort of half pressure of expectations of oh you know he's gonna be an f1 for 2024 the whole like audi thing and the sauber and you know you you just feel like he'll get in to f1 eventually even if he doesn't have an amazing season this year i feel like he's sort of he's got the years and he's done enough to prove that he's good um i think that he's cursed and that, that that will mean that he won't win the title i think that he's just got too much baggage in that aspect and i don't trust art to take a driver to the title uh because when the last time they did that, it was with Nick and Mr. De Vries was everything that Porsche hasn't been last year or wasn't last year, I should say. Um, I think Porsche is amazing. I just don't think he's able to just get it done in this format. I think it's, he'll be great in F1, but F2 format is not, is not as his, his thing. Uh, Martins is an F3 champion and he's actually older by two years than his current teammates. So that's quite interesting, but, I think that Martins showed the sort of thing that Porsche needs. So maybe they, you know, hopefully they could work off each other. Um, I think I'd, I, I remember uh, predicting that ART were going to win the team's championship this year. I think I, I, I feel that Martins will finish comfortably in the top 10. Um, yeah. To be honest but, with you now, coming to think of it, I was going to choose another team, but looking at their lineup, I'm like, they're really stronger than Teo and Victor Martin. Nah, yeah, yeah, that's a it's a strong lineup. It is mm. it is scarily French, but mm. scarily good at the same time. Yeah, I said now, the, the, the reason the reason I talk about like the overly Frenchness is that it's it's a recipe that should work, but mm. a lot of the time it doesn't because of a lot of internal fighting and all that kind of stuff. But Alpine on paper, <laughs> Al, Alpine, yeah, this year Renault in the past, look on paper it should be brilliant. Mm. Um. But now that we've said it, <laughs> watch it implode. Well, one yeah, thing I... that I want to just bring up is you talk about curse, Tyler. We used to say hmm. that ART had a curse seat. It seemed to Second, not necessarily be the case. Seat, yeah. Yes. And are you thinking then that might return this year? Sounds like Porsche is cursed or it's not ART? No, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's not an ART thing on the sense of like they can't, they're not good enough to give two drivers competition seasons or you know something like they pick a bad driver alongside their strong one it's just that um 
they are prone to making some questionable mistakes at key points. Like Porsche has had a couple of pit stop problems in key races um, and obviously the reliability, which is not the team's fault, but it's just like, oh, it comes under ART at the end of the day. Um, so I think that Martins won't fall into that second seat curse issue. Um, it's just a case of, I don't know if they can win in, a, in an F2 like uh, Martins could in F3. I just feel like there's a bit of a difference. Um, but either way, I think, yeah, they're a really strong, really, really strong group. And I spoke to Sebastian Philippe, their team principal, a couple of weeks ago, and I literally asked him about the Frenchness of the team and how that felt. And he said that, if anything, it helps because, you know, they all just speak their native tongue, mm. like from the, the guys in the factory to the drivers, and they all sort of speak the same language until they get onto to the race day. And then it's, you know, it's go time. So, you know, if there's a team that can get their, you know, stuff together this year, then, you know, it could be ART. I, I, I share Josh's feelings for ART. I, I'm just not sure if Paul shares got it 100%. Let's move on to Campos. They have... Veteran Ralph Boschong returning again, and they've got a rookie, Kushmani, in the second seat. It's somewhat similar, I suppose, in terms of age and youth as they had last year with, with uh, Ollie Caldwell being there. Um, Ralph Boschong, safe pair of hands, maybe guiding Kushmani a little bit. It's it's a difficult one for me to call, really. And Josh. Campos are a solid outfit, a solid racing team. They've never been competing really at the top consistently in Formula 2. Is this going to change this year? I mean, like, when was the last time they actually had a driver that was up there? I think the last time was 2015, 2016 with Rio Harianto. Huh? Jack Aiken, Jack Aiken, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe. They don't really have anyone up there that challenges consistently which is not a reflection on them they're not a bad team um it's just the other teams around them um you know ralph boschong i think was his debut year and we weren't expecting much of him and then was a second year where he started to secure podiums and it's like okay this is quite good um i may be is this his fourth year it depends on how you define it. When we spoke to him, he was saying his last year was pretty much his second season. But then he had the injury, so it comes down to how you view a full season. Because uh, yeah. second season, right. well, in terms Sorry, of having, having a, full, a full year, uh, maybe in his third year. I'm just I'm having a look. But look, I would say now, I'd, I'd say now he's entering his fifth. I'm season. going to completely friggin' amateur my way through this stuff. Hang it's, on, it's, I think this, this, this statistically is his fifth season because he started five seasons and raced. At least okay, five. so he started yeah. 20, yeah. 2017, he didn't do the full year. 2018, he didn't do the full year. 2019, he did less, he did about half the season, maybe a little bit more. Did only one round in 2020, then a full season in 2021, and then sort of half a season in 2022. This guy's allergic to all completing <laughs> the rest of the season. <laughs> Um, yes. so I, I think that's one of the things I'll predict for this season is that he won't complete it. Um, mm -hmm. no, like the, the thing is, <laughs> oh, you just got a bad history, Ralph, when it comes to this stuff. I mean, this is your Taylor Pershier kind of curse. You've jinxed uh, it. In, in, all, in all honesty, though, I'm glad he came away from that injury fine and he's back racing. Uh, because in the last two seasons of you know competing with Campos, there were some very good results from him. You know, and you know, that's what we want to see. I'm a bit miffed as to what his end goal is here. Like, where is he aiming? It's a lot of money to put into F2, especially over multiple seasons. So, I do wonder what his end game is uh, overall, but you know, I think really good, dependable driver, a couple more podiums this year, and yeah, um. I don't know. Unless there's, a, unless there's a drastic shift in form from Campos, I'm not really expecting anything more. As for Kushmini, solid peddler. He'll be getting up to speed in the Campos, which is not the easiest of things, but I think I'd probably say he might he may beat Boshong in the in the teammate battle. That is a that is a yeah, a big shout if comes true. Tyler, you look as skeptical as I feel but maybe josh is referring to ralph doing about mm. four rounds before having to sit out that's my season. point 
Wow. Um, I mean, you can be honest. You can call me a lunatic if you want. No, let's say the thing is with, <laughs> with the thing is with Kushmine is that he um, statistically is a driver who you'd expect to finish at the back of F two this season because of statistically, the fact that, yep, yeah, because of the fact that he hasn't got the results of a driver that you then think could go into F two and and reproduce a decent standing. Um, however, a lot of performances will go sort of unremembered, forgotten uh, from last year, where at times he was, you know, like top five on the grid for an entire feature race and then just binned it out of nowhere or got disqualified from qualifying from a pole, I believe, or, or mm. something along those lines. I, I'm unfortunately not as up to date with my F3 as I am my F2, but I know that he was a, a, a quick driver. Um so it'll be interesting to see what he's like alongside someone so experienced with Ralph. Um, that's literally the perfect person to learn from. Hopefully, Ralph's facet syndrome, which you know is a pretty nasty little thing to have as a driver and sort of niggling away at you, and he battled through it. Tough, 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 tough guy, um, and got a feature race podium in Imola. You know he's there when he needed to be, and then after what was it four rounds out straight, he came back and got a sprint race podium in his first race back in Spa. I mean. You don't do that unless you're good. I know it's a sprint race, but you don't do that. And um, I th think he'll have pretty much the exact same season this year. I think, yeah, he'll, he'll get, probably get one podium, my prediction. A Bosch on podium. It's pretty much saved F2, Hall of Fame. Um, and then I think Miney has the capability to do well. My only worry is that Campos are not very strong. Um, it seems like they've almost gone slightly backwards since like the, the likes of Aitken raced were there. Mm. Um but then again, Boshong literally missed, you know, as we as we said, pretty much half a season. Um, so that's a lot of points that you know doesn't <laughs> doesn't happen. So it's a different, one, a difficult one to call with Campos. They could be maybe be a surprise. Um, my point is that I think there's no pressure on them at all. So if they don't have a great season, I don't think many people are going to look at them and say, "Oh, they're bad." Josh, anything? Yeah, add? yeah, I'd agree with that. Well, I'm going to take the final thoughts away from Josh as the president of the unofficial Ralph Boshong fan club and. Put a shout out that Ralph will grab a win this year. I don't know if it's going to be sprint or feature race, but he's never won. He's never won in uh, in F2. He's only scored thirds. Exactly. No. And he had, a, he, had podiums. A, he had a streak of about 10 races where he got about four, like in terms of him racing, and about hmm. four P3 finishes across um, feature race and sprint races. And I do think, should hmm, the stars true, align, actually, yeah. I think he's more than capable of doing it so that could be that could be the goal that could be the goal and that's a, Jim that's a great statistic that I, that's the sort of statistic that I'd never expect to to hear from you that's the lovely that, sort of stuff I like to hear from our F2 editor that sort of faith in the podcast host thanks Tyler that means that means an awful lot to me this is controversial I'm going to put Carl in as the third team that we're going to go to in alphabetical order but I don't know if there's Rodin or Carlin or Rodin Carlin. It, 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 it's, it's the sponsor, isn't it? It's a, the thing that confuses me about mm. it is that Lawson was the Kiwi driver. He's gone, and now they've got a Kiwi sponsor, and, which is well, like you say, the, you say the sponsor, but it's a bit of a buyout from uh, from the sort of stuff that we saw, right? So I, I, yeah, don't, I really don't know. So I'm going to say Carlin for now until Alex Jakes comes along and starts correcting the right way to say it. But Rodin Carlin, Carlin Rodin Carlin, whatever you want to call it, Zane Maloney. Enzo Fittipaldi, a couple of Zeds in their, their names, but a really exciting driver lineup, I'd call it. That Zane Maloney, when we spoke about him in the intro, kind of shocked everybody going onto the second part of the F3 season last year. Could have nabbed the title, was a, extremely close to, to doing so. And then Enzo Fittipaldi really emulating what Logan Sargent did in F3 with the car that he had, with the team that he was in. Um, trouser, I think you called them, Josh. Um, Shalru, whatever the pronunciation is. Shrouse? I think it was Shrouse, was it? Shrouse, exactly. And then, yeah, he's he's done a lot with not a lot, if you can catch my drift. Carlin, however, in F2 at least, solid team. Solid team, solid driver lineup. Josh Revel, your thoughts? I don't know why I'm just not that hyped on Enzo Fittipaldi. I don't know why I'm just not. I'm just not. I'm not sensing whatever it is that I'm supposed to be seeing in this kid. Um, which you know, I understand people will be like, "How the hell can you not see last season and not see that he's a good driver?" It's like 
it's a good driver, but I'm not quite getting the hype. I'm not thinking he is necessarily re- well, put, it, put it to you this way. Of all the Red Bull geniuses on that grid right now, I don't think he's anywhere near the top. So um that's can we, can we just, where just, I sort can of... we can we just get your I want because I'm interested and I'm sure the, the guys and gals at home listening as well are interested. Could you just now, without spoiling it too much, tops and uh, rate the Red Bull Juniors top six? Because oh, there are six, so from one to six. Red Bull Juniors uh top six. Uh <laughs> Liam Lawson, Liam Lawson, Liam Lawson, Liam Lawson, <laughs> Liam Lawson, Liam Lawson. Uh, I wish he was Moving on. <laughs> and, and F2. I wish, yeah, yeah. So to so the oh, six God. drivers, the six Red Bull Juniors. So there's uh, Hadjar Crawford. Um, That's hard. I mean, like, you look at, I think, honestly, the ones, that, the ones that you put at the top are very close to each other. They've mm. got their merits, you know? Mm. But the thing is, in no particular order, you got Hadja, um, yeah, Hadja, Maloney, Hauga, Iwasa, yeah. and God, there's got to be Fittipaldi uh, and Crawford are the last two. Okay, never mind. But the thing is, is that those four uh, on their days are amazing, really good drivers, very solid drivers, um, ones you're excited for in the future. Um, the other two, I can't get excited over. <clears throat> or at least su- not as much, not as much as the four that I just mentioned. Are you surprised so, that they that they that Fittipaldi went there, or that they were interested in him? Marco's a very odd person. Like he seems to judge his driver's performance off a Wikipedia page. <laughs> um, like he started to get really hyped up about Liam toward the end of last year. It's like, why now? Like. <laughs> Why now are you starting to realize that now that his engine's holding together, now you're interested in them? <laughs> Vips. Um, maybe. But anyway, like we're deviating from the point here. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Enzo Fittipaldi. Um, like, who was his teammate last year at uh, at Shrell's? It was. Uh, oh my god, asking, that's so nice. You're only asking the F2 editor and uh, the podcast guy who <laughs> spoke about it oh last year. Come oh on, guys, how me? me. Bollock Bassey, Beckman. Oh, Cold that's, why. that's why we can't remember because it yeah, because was... they switched between three because they because yeah. they switched all the yeah, time. So... And Bollock Bassey really went into the deep end there. Oh. Um, so yeah, um, look, mm. the point is, yeah, he's going to be going into a good team with a good teammate, very good teammate. Um, the moment Maloney gets on top of how to master the F2 car, how to manage the tires well, to do everything that's needed to be successful in there, Fiddy is not going to be able to hang with him. Mm. And, you know, if Maloney gets on top of that fast enough, he will finish ahead of him in, ahead of him in the standings. And at that point, Marco may look at him and think, okay, why have I got you here? So, mm. but then again, like... N- <laughs> To put it lightly, Formula One academies are not free lunches. They're hardly scholarships. So, um, you know, who knows really how much Red Bull are actually putting into into Enzo's campaign. Mm. I certainly don't. But, yeah. Anyway, personally, don't have much hype in Enzo. He could prove me wrong, though. I don't mind being proven wrong. So, uh, hey, Enzo, if you're, if you're better than what I say you are, then go ahead and do it. Otherwise, Zane, big hype on that guy. Best prospect out of the Caribbean right now, apart from uh, Alex Powell and Fraser McDonald. You know, really damn good. In my opinion, the Red Bull Junior I'm most excited about. Um, And yeah, 100% are going to be absolutely in the corner of he's going to beat uh, Fittipaldi this year. Uh, Top five or top six, either one of those two. Well, Tyler, I'm, again, the host here, so I'm not going to put in touch with my thoughts on this, but I do think that maybe recency bias at Maloney, I do echo and agree with what Josh is, the most exciting one of the Red Bull junior team right now. Um, such a such a solid talent. Was delighted to see him picked up. He's now joining another Red Bull talent, one of the many Enzos that they've got. And 
it's going to be a head to head basically and i don't think either of these guys are maybe looking at the alpatari seat next year maybe they are you can you tell me but is that going to put pressure on both of them that they have an equal in the other car that it's in it's the same machinery there's no excuses to say well they're in a Prima or they're in a mp or something is this going to be the the scale that tips in the favor of one of these which marco will look at well i hadn't thought about it in the way that josh put it but after he said what he said i am a firm believer in everything he just said because i just see fittipaldi is the only one with pressure in that situation not to say that he can't deal with it, but why would Maloney have pressure? He literally had an awful start to his... I mean, there's so many times that I've mentioned it and so many times that I've heard it mentioned by people on YouTube or, or whatever about the... In the same way that Wasser had an amazing second half of the season last year in F2, he went from nothing to everything and just dominated winning the last three consecutive feature races and almost four. He came second in the one before that. Um so yeah, there is a level of recency bias that I could maybe forgive, but I actually had Maloney far down. And the reason why was because when I saw him with Trident in the final round in Abu Dhabi, I feel like I got a perfect understanding of where he's at. But then again, I forget I forgot to take into account how quickly he turned things around last year in F3. Why can't he do that in F2 if he is as talented as, as obviously Red Bull think he is? In a longer season so, as well. Exactly. And... I think now, actually, I thought about it. I, I was going to say, in the same way that I think with Doruvala, um, Fittipaldi is the sort of driver who's going to finish like the same like 8th to 10th in the championship every year sort of thing. I just felt like after last year with Shrews, I thought he's got to do at least that in a Carlin because Carlin are going to be that much better. Um, if Carlin are going to be similar quality as they were last year, then Fittipaldi has every reason to finish even maybe top five. Um so solely it's down to him to prove people wrong again. He had it with Ferrari. He was the in a Ferrari in the Ferrari Driver Academy, got dropped. He's now with Red Bull. Will we see him get dropped again in, you know, two separate times in two separate years? So a lot of pressure, I feel like, on Fittipaldi. Um, but I think both drivers want to prove people wrong. So, you know, Carlin, a great team to go to, I always feel. Yeah, I very much echo that, uh, Carlin. Looked so solid last year. The only team actually capable of almost stopping Felipe Drogovic's sole attempt at taking the team's championship and very nearly did so in the last round. Let's see how they do. Moving on to Dams. <clears throat> I have another Red Bull Junior, but I think that's going to be a regular feature as we go through this. Are you Muawasa? And the, it's a weird to say controversial, but he's certainly a controversial figure in the feeder series community on... His ability, Arthur Leclerc, who is maybe the Ralph Schumacher of the brothers, not to say that he's bad. Mm. Hey, 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 Ralph Schumacher was never a bad driver. Ralph Schumacher, podiums, wins. No, no, him. no, no, not at all. I'm not saying he was a bad driver. It's just that people made the mistake of giving him a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Arthur has the same level of that. The, the, the Leclerc brothers are a PR dream for anybody. Nice kid as well. Um, come on the podcast, Arthur. Really want to have you here. But stepping away from Prema is the, the big question mark that I'm very curious to know how he's going to get on in a different environment. Maybe it is the Drogovic level of you go to a different team, things start performing well. And Dams, they are quick. We know they're quick. And maybe some of that was masked last year with the driver lineup that they had or half the driver lineup that they had. But this year, Arthur Leclerc, Ayumu Wasa, Josh Revel, what do you think? Dams builds rockets. Yeah, and I think that was masked last year due to the fact that one of their drivers was Roy Nassani. Not taking too much away from Nassani, but he's not that high caliber of driver you know, necessarily. Um, and so it kind of masked um, <clears throat> the performance in a little bit of a way. And again, not trying to take anything away from Awasa, but Leclerc is now coming in. So Le Leclerc, I've already mentioned how I wasn't a fan of his race craft. I thought he was too much of a loose cannon. And I still think that uh, there were some times in his F3 career where it's just like, that was too much. Way too ambitious a move. Um, throwing things away. Taking himself out of contention. 
one too many times. And it was just very, very frustrating to see because you can see the dude has speed, but it's not useful if you can't finish a race. Um, so if he can harness that, though, he's going to give Awasa a real problem because, I mean, I know it's just testing, but Leclerc was up there and testing above a wasa a lot of the time so yeah um you know it's, it's a good team good outfit you know solid solid team um i think we're going into the french element before you know mm. that french team leclerc who's francophone it should help out i guess so yeah um they'll have a decent successful season for sure but where Leclerc finishes is solely dependent upon whether or not he can sort of control himself almost um if he can if he can avoid his temptation of sparing backwards through into the barrier um every few races or so I can see him beating Awasa and with about 20 point buffer potentially Big shout. Um, everything's a big shout, apparently, with what I'm saying so far. But I do think Leclerc, outside of that, uh, outside of Prima, should I say, could be an interesting one. However, Iwasa going to be a bit more comfortable, maybe, at Dan's. But I think people who maybe are more recent viewers of feeder series, as generally I am, but even I was aware of, Dan's has been a damn good team. The team's champions, 2019... And then eighth, eighth, and sixth the last few seasons, which is a big step down, obviously. This year, I think, though, Tyler, they're probably back at firing on full on full power. It's it's a solid lineup. Do you think they're maybe even mm. in line with a, a team's championship fight as well, with, or even a driver's championship fight? Um, no. Uh, Ignore my hype, everybody. Some... Tyler's here to rain on that place. His... No, no. He, he, so here's his his just like. Cause like straight card hold facts. Okay. So they are under new management. I'd say recently, in the terms of just for the sake of conversation, it was like a year or two ago and by now. Uh, but since they've had Charles Peak, um, ex <laughs> racing driver, if you know Charles Peak, you know Charles Peak, um, and taken over Dams has sort of turned things around straight away. And since then, they've just got better and better and better. And it's one of them ones that because they were doing bad, people weren't paying attention to them. So the story of Iwasa going constantly that way, just constantly up, was one that I think went pretty much unnoticed until it just went and clicked. And that was in the Castellet. And from then onwards, Iwasa was, I think, the highest scoring driver um, in the series, if I'm not mistaken. I, I believe I saw a statistic on that yesterday. Um, and... I think that there's almost a lot of expectation on him now out of nowhere. I've seen so many predictions. It's almost annoyed me because I love Awasa, but I'm getting sick to death of people saying that he's going to win the title. If he does win the title, then he would have had to done, you know, he would have had to done something that I don't think he will do, which is take a bigger step than Doohan, Porsche, Hauger. I mean, you look at the drivers that he's competing against and even though he had an amazing second half of the season, um, there were so many drivers that were inconsistent, doing Porsche, uh, you know, so many good drivers. So it's not going to be the case again like this year. I think that Iwasa will finish top five. I think he'll finish fifth or fourth. Um, and I am not one for Leclerc on the basis that people with his statistics coming from F3 to F2 after, is it two or three years he was in F3, in F3 Josh? Two years. years? Three years? Well, you know. Two, three, asked, two, two years, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say. Um, and I feel that he he's not going to come in straight away and make a difference. I think next year will be, he'll be competitive. I think this year he'll be learning for the majority of the first half of the season. Um, I know that he was quick in, in testing, and I, I respect that. I just, I just don't think he's got what it takes at the moment to be consistent and score good points in F2. Um, but yeah, Dams will definitely be in the running for top three in the, in the teams again. Um, I think they will improve their points tally from last year as a team. Um, but I think that they're sort of just that bit off. They're, they're just one more step away from unlocking their full potential again. 
moving on to high tech or Tyler, is it high tech pulsate technically now with their? So I never used to call them high tech Grand Prix, which was how they were written. Uh, but I will now call them high tech pulsate because there's something about that name which is just a bit like I want to say it. I just want to. Say it. It's just weird. <laughs> It's just a weird name. It's because it's a pun that gets me. It's not, for anybody who doesn't know, it's not pulsate as in this thing pulsates. It's pulse and then the number eight. And it's uh, it's essentially a, a play on words, which I appreciate. They um, they also have a, a Red Bull junior team lineup, as in both of their drivers are Red Bull junior team drivers. Jack Crawford stepping up to, well, both of them stepping up to Formula 2 uh, as a rookie and Isaac Hadjar Isaac Hadjar probably coming in with a little bit more expectation considering how well he did last year Jack Crawford less so uh, as pressure but I think people do forget this kid's still 17 and is now what in his third season on the F1 weekend so this yeah. guy's been doing it for a good while Hadjar had a bit of what you called earlier Tyler the Marvin, maybe maybe Josh said it, but Marco taking a fancy to this kid. Um, was it after mm. that Monaco round in, in Freca and or Freca as it was at the time? I'm not saying it's undeserved. Hajar is an excellent driver. The two of them, though, at high tech, uh, I, I like high tech, but they make mistakes. And I wonder if this is going to cost both of them any chance of a championship, high tech chance of a championship, or maybe it's going to turn around. Uh, Josh Revel, it's a, uh, it's a. I don't know. Is this is this the best Red Bull lineup team? Is this going to all crash and burn? Is this the best Red Bull lineup? You got Jack Crawford in there, that immediately takes him out of the running. Oh mate, come um, on. we like Jack Crawford. I'm well. not. I mean, yeah, he's a talented dude, but I just got no hype on him. Um, I mean. There are glimpses here and there of his potential, but nothing so much to the point where I'm ready to jump on the bandwagon. I'm not there right now. Can I just say, though, is this something that people do overlook that age? That this kid is really young still going into it. And mm. the Porsche hype was there because this young kid was getting podiums and so on. And people seem to forget that Crawford is 17. He may be, he may be young, but again, I'm just... Well, I... There are uh, there are other younger drivers out there where you can see that potential. I'm just not seeing that with with Jack. Um, so talented dude, got no real hype for him. He'll be lucky to break into the top ten of the standings this year. Um, as for Isaac Hadjar, quick dude, but he seems to get the jitters really easily when the pressure gets to him. Like it wasn't so much about the qualifying last year that sort of um i noticed it was also he seemed to really have gotten let the pressure get to him in those races like he didn't seem to be altogether calm which i'm not necessarily having a go at him because he's a young kid it was his first year of f3 understand the pressure but you've got to deal with it you know like You've got to deal with the pressure as it comes. So it's something that he's definitely got to learn and harness. If he can get that done, then yeah, we know he's got the speed to make results happen for him. So yeah, I think he'll beat uh, Crawford in the high tech team battle. As for where he'll finish overall in the standings, um, I think title push will be beyond reach for him, but yeah. I think a win or two this year is not beyond question. Tyler, I would have said a title push would be beyond Hajar last year as well, in all honesty, and then he comes around and surprises me. Is that something that he might do this year? And your thoughts on uh, Jack Crawford? Am I being a bit too apologetic saying is a, is a young kid doing this? Because he's a young kid doing this, and a 17-year-old in F2 is still a big shout. I know, but that's the the crazy world we live in, where you know you're 17 and you're still not hitting targets. Um, I think the thing is with Crawford is that compared to everybody he raced with that was in the title fight last year, um, he finished seventh, which was of those seven the lowest. Um, 
and those seven have gone on to graduate this year to F2. And I want Jack to show everybody that he can just do what sort of Vesti did last year mm. or what Hauger did last year and just win a feature race out of nowhere and just shut people up. Because I think that Crawford, if he would massively take people by surprise, if he just had a couple of good performances this year, if even that would be enough. Um, I think the high tech factor is, is worth mentioning. Um, felt like with Vips last year, you've got a really talented driver and it just kept failing. Um, you had like wins that were literally on, you know, in their hands that they sort of threw away. And it's just like, they've had a really awful winter series as well um, yeah. in both from Eck and F4UAE. They had serious, serious like mechanical and, and engine issues. And I know that that won't, you know, it's different cars completely, but I feel like there's an element in any sport where if you start off that badly, that you're going to have to really do a lot of catching up to, in terms of preparations for the season. Um, and I think that Hajar is their shining light. Um, I don't think that either of them will finish in the top 10. Um, wow. But, I think that that's because as we, uh, well, as, as you mentioned, Jim, and as I will say, Hajar is what, 19 years old? 18. Uh, 18. So 18 and 17. I mean, if someone's going to get annoyed at me for saying, oh no, neither of them are going to be in the top 10, then my answer is, well, I mean, name me the last 18 and 17 year old teammates who finished that high up in F2 um, because it doesn't happen that often. Very good point. I think Max Verstappen and that recent influx of the what the Russell and Norris kind of era and Leclerc has maybe made people reassess the ages of stuff. I was actually doing some research on you know, back Damon Hill and stuff in the nineties and Weber, and like people are joining Formula One in the late twenties. It was nuts. Like it's stuff that you just wouldn't see these days. So the landscape has shifted dramatically, and maybe we are looking at these kids thinking you have to do it now, but. Crawford could win, or Hajar Haja could win F2 in 2025 and make Formula One that way as a as a 21-year-old or something. So or 20 year old. So let's let's find out. Let's talk about MP Motorsport, aka Prima 2022, with Dennis Hauger, Jehan Darvala jumping over together, hand in hand, over to the team's champions. But uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it was really the the Drogovic team champions with Clement Novalak only contributing a little bit towards that points tally last year. MP Motorsports seem to have repositioned themselves as a quite desirable team from that one season. I know people say you're only as good as your last result, so it does seem that people really have hung on to that with both these guys going over. We saw Felipe Drogovic go from... <clears throat> Virtuosi back as it was then to MP Motorsport and what run away with things. They clearly have a car that is capable of of a championship. We've seen that in the last year. They, they won the championship. Do they have drivers that are capable of a championship this year? Jay and Daruvala in season four, I think it is. Dennis Hauger, season two. He took two seasons to win his F3 championship. What do you think, Josh Rebel? Both capable drivers. And it's clearly a capable team now they've got the resources that they need the only thing is is that um whether or not um it's just it's just such a you know it's it's a complete guessing game you know at the end of the day um, that is what a preview generally is mate come on yeah yeah it is it is it is a little bit isn't it just a little bit not be the um, intro <laughs> so, so, so Please, it's going to be an intro. For God's sake, you guys are going to be the death of me, I swear. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so you know, I'll, I'll, I might as well start off with Jahan Darivala, um, yes. a name which for some reason no one seems to be able to pronounce Jake correctly. Samson is going to be so happy. Blame Alex Jakes. He, 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 I, 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 I went to a couple of different interviews and that's how Darivala himself says his name, is Darivala. Yeah. So mm. it's like, okay, I'll just use that. But anyway... um. I think he's a little bit undervalued and, and a way, I think a lot of people look at how long he's been in there compared to him, especially against Yuki. Um, forgetting the fact that when he got the desired engine swap out 
all of a sudden, Yuki wasn't deserting him anymore. In fact, a lot of the time, he was ahead of him. So there is a bit of undervalue um, un- because they, they take a lot of what happened that year at face value and they think, well, he's not that he's not that good. He's always proven to be a decent peddler and race and his race craft, you know, race speed is very solid, very solid indeed. He's just a bit allergic toward getting results together. And there are drivers like that, you know, where it's just like, for some reason, just can't seem to stitch up a result. So, but it's the fourth season so far. He's out of the Red Bull Junior team, uh, if I remember correctly. Is he out? Yeah. Uh, what's so, the confirmation with that? He was, is it, it's not even associated with Red Bull, right? Yeah, he it's uh, it's his formula. E. I think I'll, I'll just mention now, just so that we are clear on Dorival this year. N- Nidhi said it. Um, he yeah. is a test and reserve driver with Mahindra in Formula E, and that is his only affiliation outside of F2. Right. So I don't know if this is going to be acting as a bridge toward potential Formula E seats uh, for the next season, but if it isn't, my question is, what is he aiming for? Mm-hmm. Um, it's the only thing. It's just like, he's more capable than people may think, but I'm not sure what he's he's aiming for here. More paid McLaren um, tests? Uh, more paid McLaren tests. Yeah, but I don't know if that'll lead to anything. I mean, Sean Galal um, kept on paying for Toro Rosso rides, and that never eventuated to anything. So, yeah, it's a total... Um, it's a total un- unknown as to what he's going to do, but at least for the season, you know that uh, as long as things go his way, you know he'll perform well, well enough at least. As for Halga, there's definitely potential there, but there are the frequency of mistakes is a little bit higher than what you would want. Um, and that's been something that's carried over through his entire junior career. I'm not saying he's mistake prone. It's just that they happen a bit more often than what you would want. So uh, that may hinder uh, his progress with the championship because I think he's going to be one of the contenders this year. Hmm. No, like good team. He always performs well after, after, after a year's racing in the cars. Like we've seen that. Um, so yeah. Uh, I think it'll be close between here and Porsche, but yeah, a top three, top four for Hauger this year. Whereas Daravala, seventh or eighth, something like that. But yeah. I am curious. Um, well, just want to say one thing for anybody who is new to a feeder series, we're talking with regards to an engine change from back in 2020 when. Darivala uh, was teammates with Yuki Tsunoda and it turned out that when he changed his engine, his results actually got him a little bit better and uh, culminated in a sprint race win in Bahrain or Secure, whichever one it was back then. The the year Hamilton yep. had to sit out of it. But yeah, it's these are two talented drivers and I don't know if Formula One is going to be in Darivala's future with the way he's separated from Red Bull. That's a big jump to get back to Formula One no matter how many McLaren drives you go to but Formula E he could really really do well there Hago however what again you're only as good as your last result this guy blitzed Formula 3 the year before last like blitzed it right mm-hmm. no one else in the championship levels of Drogovic really from last year we saw in F2 one season with Prima people expect him to do a Piastri who were also somewhat rewritten the rule books and I feel that people kind of uh, Josh sounds like you you think he might be a championship contender but people have forgotten that Hauga can do extremely well and could well be taking the championship this year Tyler well he certainly is giving off the vibe of someone who could be a champion um spoke to him two weeks ago and um you get this sort of feeling with um, Nordic drivers that they have this sort of robotic element where they will eventually just reach their peak and just have a have a dominant season. 
Um, he seems like the driver, sort of driver that has a lot of self confidence. Um, I think this second year is is perfect for him. You know, he's joining a team who technically have the best car on the grid. He's stepping into, and and I use the phrase Hauger himself is stepping into the champion's seat because of the fact that I think Derivala's focus is now on FE, not F2. I think he's accepted that F1 is not the goal here and that FE is now where his future lies. And I think that once you have a driver that's sort of made that decision up in their mind, they never commit to the degree that someone who is fighting for F1 seat is. Um, if, you're di- if you disagree with that, then fair enough, D- Darovala could win the title then. <laughs> What's <laughs> stopping him? Um, but realistically, I think Hauger did enough in his rookie season against Darovala. He finished 11 points behind him. I think that Hauger certainly is top three in the championship. Um, he seems ready and understanding of the fact that this is a championship season waiting to happen. Um, you know, he's got all the tools. I think that he's sort of fallen slightly off the radar a bit in terms of the Red Bull Juniors. I think there's with the the signings of Fittipaldi and Maloney, there's other spotlights being sort of pressed around. I think Hauger, if anything, is sort of the pressure's off because of how sort of mediocre people felt Prima were last year. So I think MP, um, I spoke to Sander Dorsman, their team principal, and he um, was just saying that they're feeling sort of quite excited about this year, but they're not getting overly worried or precious or anxious about things. They're just going to keep going. And they give off the sort of vibe of a team who will definitely finish at least third um, in the team's championship again. So MP are going to be strong again, regardless of Felipe moving on. Moving on, sounds like he's going to die, uh, which isn't uh, <laughs> isn't the case. He might be making his debut uh, in Formula One. Oh. Which if you're listening in a few months' time, maybe we look like idiots when Lance Stroll fixes his wrist. Now, going from the team's champions at MP Motorsport and a lineup which could take the the championship to what I'm seeing online as. Um, the backmarker team, or the backmarker in waiting, PHM Racing, new team by Choro, uh, Roy Nisani, Brad Benavides. Not a lineup that people are getting overly excited about. Roy Nisani has been in the sport for a good many years now. Um, Brad Benavides has taken a step up. He's going to be a rookie in Formula Two this year after. A quick stop, I guess you'd call it a quick pit stop in Formula Three last year on his on his way up. Um, personally, I think another season in F three would maybe have benefited this kid a little bit more. But irrespective, he's in F two now. Maybe that's going to help him for any future seasons. But Josh Revel, this is going to be a, a tough year, I think, for PHM in there. Well, it's essentially their debut debut season, even though they're going to be. How did you call it, Tyler? That PHM are managing the operations. Is that right? So it's essentially still Sharu's, um, you know, the personnel of the team, the pit stop guys, all that are going to be Sharu's, but they're under management of PHM who will then take over fully in next year. Um, hopefully, as they said, um, with members of Sharu's coming over from them. Josh, how do you think that's going to go for this year? Those two drivers. <laughs> They stick out like a sore thumb compared to everyone else. Um, you know, if Brad or Roy are listening to this, look, I'm sorry, guys, but compared to these other ones, like it's the results don't look very good, you know. Like, we'll take Brad for a moment here, he's relatively green, like entering this, entering this game, he was barely in F3. <laughs> No, he didn't do a full season of it. And he's jumping straight into F2, which is a boat with temperamental tires. It's it's a bulk to learn for people that have been in F3 for two years, let alone someone who's been in there for half a season. So, you know, he's going to have a lot to deal with there, you know, learning the car and getting up to speed. Um. And, you know, then you've got to consider the fact that he's not going to be in the best team either, or the second best, or the third best. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a struggle for him to get 
points, never mind like notable results. As for Roy Nassani, keep it clean. Keep why it clean. is he still here? Like, why is he still here? It's I don't mean that in the necessarily a bad way. It's just like, what is the end game here? You know, for him, is he still trying to win the championship? get the super license points to get to formula one uh but he, he's now how old is he 28 i think he's 20 yeah, 20? yeah. that yeah. that is late for an f1 driver to enter <clears throat> back in the time where formula one races were still broadcast in black and white hmm. but to today it's a it's almost as if if you're entering if you enter f1 in your 20s it's almost too late that's the mentality um so there's that um and there doesn't seem to be any notable improvement in results or anything like that there's a lot of um self-inflicted wounds from him where he can be quick but as oftentimes as he is quick he's also a very interesting driver interesting in the same way that Sergio Canamasas was where it's just like you're fast but you're way too rapid like you look at him in your mirrors and you don't know what he's going to do hmm. uh or if he looks in his mirrors you don't know what he's going to do and Halga found that out the hard way at Silverstone which was just kind of part and parcel of what's sort of very frustrating about Nasani is that he just shoots himself in the foot too often um so i'd like to see him iron out the mistakes and be more consistent uh because he's not a slow driver but i do wonder about the end game here because it's a case of which it's just like all these years not just in f2 but on the junior in the junior categories he was racing around at a time where formula renault 3.5 was healthy hmm. um never mind still alive so yeah it's he's a curious case um then and then you got the dynamic between he and brad benavidez or it's just like ugh. yeah benavidez may beat him in the standings down to consistency more than anything else but uh yeah i'll, I'll wish them the best but i'm not holding out much hope um Tyler, Br Brad Benavidez step yeah. up very quickly. Uh, as I said, another season F3 may have benefited. Maybe there's financial reasons to think let's just get into F2 sooner than later. Roy Nassani, opposite problem, been in F2 a long time. That's a lot of money spent. We're throwing money at Williams, getting some FP1 sessions. That Williams partnership has ended. Josh is asking, what's the end goal here? THM coming along. Is it a holding pattern year? What what's going on with this? What do you think we're going to see from this team twenty twenty three? Well, just quickly, I've noticed the amount of times that Josh has said tonight um, that he doesn't know what the end goal is for drivers. Which I love that when it's multiple drivers who are being questioned what their goal is. I think with um, with PHM, um, it's one of them ones. It would be different to VAR last year. But Animus Four, I think, showed to anybody with a sense of motorsport knowledge that they were a good team it's just that they had a bit of inconsistencies with their drivers um they had changes literally Hughes went off to do Formula E um and it was their first year uh, in you know stepping up to that level ever you know since their formation in the 80s um and with PHM they're an organization that didn't even exist over two years ago <clears throat> so you can't say that you know this is a, a a stupid idea considering how well they've performed in formula 4 phm are a legitimate motorsport business team and they will do i think massive help to the future of motorsport especially in germany i think they're a really important um sort of new team who are running all these new uh, philosoph you know philosophical methods with the drivers, they're trying to keep drivers within the team all the way up the ladder. Um, they're doing a lot of experimental things, which I think some of them will work and they will revolutionise the junior series world. 
Um, but this is the worst place to start because they haven't been able to choose their F2 drivers. Sharu's chosen them before they um, got the sort of opportunity to step in and say, wait a minute. Um, they don't have any F2 experience, so they're sort of letting Sharu's do all the work in that regard. I think PHM are doing more on the F3 side to learn than the F2 at the moment. So Sharu's had a decent car. Fittipaldi showed that last year. Um, will that car be able to stay at that level? It's difficult to know. Sharu's are not a big team. Uh, they're exceptional for their size, but um, it's unfortunately, size doesn't always matter. <laughs> you must have heard that before, Tyler. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, I don't think that, you know, people are looking at Sharu's and going... Um, Oh, you know, there's just a driver, there's a rookie and you know, a veteran partnership. It's not like Boshong and Miney. Um, Nisani, if you compare him to someone like Maldonado, someone who's got a bit of a you know hot streak uh, while also being quick, it's not the same. Um, Nisani doesn't have that level of speed, I think, um, that will allow you to win races. Um, I just hope that the one thing this driver lineup does do is it sets PHM up for a good place in the future. Um, because to be honest, you're not going to be ever watching PHM this year and going, you know, oh wow, they're the center of attention for this one specific, you know, point of the race, unless it's I don't know, being on the back of a truck back to the pits. Wow. That's uh, I was gonna say you ended it on a positive note and then you shove a little truck on the way back to the pits. But 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 Paul Paul Muller, their team owner, is a really nice guy and he I think he, he knows what he's doing. So I think PHM are in good hands. Prima now. Frederick Vesti, Ollie Behrman, both academy drivers. Uh, Fred Vesti, almost like a wasa, ended up reminding people why he is a Mercedes junior later in the season. And I think people kind of looked at him like, what are you doing at the start of the season? Forget that, again, uh, the Piastri's changed everything it's like you must be a rookie or and Leclerc and Russell you must be a rookie and do well otherwise you're crap and that's not necessarily the case best is now with Prima where he did well before Oli Behrman I know Josh you're a fan I think everybody's a fan I was making excuses for young drivers earlier Behrman's just as young and he's bloody quick Prima had a misstep last year from their recent successes is this the year to to get back onto things a uh, prima going to be a force to be reckoned with with this lineup josh frederick vesti is the mercedes junior that you forget as a mercedes junior that's because Kimi antonelli is a shining light for the future it's exactly yeah it's just like antonelli's there and it just sort of like what th there are other ones <laughs> it's just like it's almost that way um <clears throat> Which is a little bit of a shame because Vesti is quick. Um, he was up against Tail last year and he didn't, didn't do too bad, especially toward the second half of the season. Uh, now he's with Prima, second year. He's he's got to prove his worth, you know. A uh, couple of race wins from this year, around about sixth or seventh in the driver's standings. Um. Uh, as for the bear, um, what did I write? Uh, what? Top five potentially in the championship. Boy was aggressive as hell toward the end of the last F3 championship, especially in Zandvoort, what you where said it's just like... Zandvoort, You've got no chill, or this boy's got no chill, was what you said. Yeah, I, I was watching it. He was just bombard, just, just dive bombing and elbowing people out of the way. It's just like, all right, Rubbin's racing. I appreciate all that stuff. I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with what he's doing, but uh, okay, make sure you don't kill anybody with your driving. Um, he's got heaps of potential. You know, he showed a lot of that last year. Um, very close to winning the title. Um, and especially, you know, beating the likes of Arta in the other car, in the other Prema, who was there the previous year you know so it only added to the hype train and you know there's there's a lot of hype on around him going into the season so yeah i definitely think he's um championship material i definitely think that it's f1 material now ollie if you're watching this don't let this get to your head please 
don't let my don't let any of this praise get to you get to your head because you know ideally we'd like it to be a close championship we'd like you to be in the championship fight uh but yeah top top four by my reckoning uh it's a good it's a good healthy lineup that prem have on their hands tyler going based off of the past we've got Oli Berman, who, if everyone's excited by Kimi Antonelli winning Italian German F4 with ADAC F4, we've got Oli Berman who's done the exact same thing before it was even cool to do this sort of stuff. So Berman, solid. Got the first, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And then Fred Vesti as well, very overlooked, but when you talk about dominating seasons, his Fret campaign was beyond recognition for domination. This guy was winning pretty much every race. So both of them can prove that they can do extremely well. The now teammates at essentially the top level Premier can offer. It's a solid lineup. Um, what do you think is going to happen with what were the all conquering Premier team up until last year? Okay, well, um, I've written too many articles at this point uh, that have been involved with Premier that have started with the, something to do with the fact that they went back to back drivers and teams champions in 2020 and 2021 with Schumacher and Piastri winning those drivers championships. And then obviously had the season they did last year with a reigning formula three champion and the Rivala who had a lot of experience and asking the question, you know, will they return to their glory? I would want to start pushing a narrative that this is a different time for Prima now. They're switching into a slightly new era. I think last year they had a driver lineup that sort of didn't feel like a Prima lineup. At the beginning of the season, it I thought it would have, been fine but then by halfway through the season it, it it felt like even if the car would have been a good car that neither driver would have won the title anyway um and i think that this year you, you just feel that that can't happen again with vesti who has experience with prima before he finished uh an ex you know an impressive um fourth as a rookie in f3 did, did the same thing in his second year with art so technically all that extra experience you know, in, in with ART didn't help him at all. Um, so I think that basically Primo are going to be able to fight for the title in, in the team's championship. I think it's between them and ART. Um, I think that Primo have probably got the second best lineup. If Behrman can, imp- uh, can continue to progress as he did joining F3, which only the best of the best do, only the Charles Leclerc's, George Russell's, those guys are able to do that. But Paul Cher, to, to be fair, did it. He finished fifth in his rookie season and won a feature race at Monaco. That's generational. Behrman, I'd expect, is in that category. So it's mad to think that for a 17-year-old, I think he's the most hyped driver in F2 since Paul Cher, by clearly. Um, I, but I don't think he can win the title. I don't think Behrman can win the title this year. Um, I think that's just out of the reach because he's just so inexperienced that there will be mistakes. As uh, as Josh mentioned, you know his approach in Zandvoort will probably backfire at points in the season. Um, but Vesti, really nice guy, Mercedes Junior. I know that people forget about him, but I think that's because he sort of does what's expected, and that's about it. He's a very very Mercedes ish type driver, mm-hmm. so I don't see any reason why Vesti can't um, fight for the title either. I think both of them could. I do think Berman will finish above Vesti though. It's a solid lineup, it really is. Um... Trident now, who Trident F3, uh, you know the meme with the big bulky dog with muscles um, mm. and then the doge sort of dog looking a little bit more meek. That's how they seem to feel. And it's like the opposite of Carlin with F2 and F3. And Trident are like that mm. between F3 and F2. So Roman Stanek, Clement Novelak, both the epitome of decent drivers, I would say. I'm not saying that in any negative way because they are drivers who deserve to be in F2, I believe. But based off recent performances, I don't think they're generational talents. I don't necessarily, easy for me to say, I don't necessarily think they're going to be F1 drivers, but they're not bad drivers and they're drivers that aren't taking anything away from Formula 2, in my opinion. The racing for a team, like I say, who aren't as strong as they are in F3, Josh, what are we going to get from a Stanek-Novelak-Trident 
combination for 2023. I love your description of the meme. It's, it was like listening to George Russell there for a moment. Uh, but it's these two drivers are just like you know the speed's there for these two. Why can't they get the results that we know that they should be capable of? It's like it's it's just a bit strange to me. Like they should be doing better than they actually are. But yeah, it took Stanek a while to get to where he got last year. And then Novelak, we saw he was perfectly fine in F3 at Trident when he was alongside Doohan. And then he gets to Formula 2 and he drowns against um, a Filippo Drigovic. It wasn't even a matter of just like Drigovic was a bit better over the season. It was a case of he just left him for dead. And it almost cost MP the the team's championship, despite the fact that Drigovic won by about three championships. Hmm. You know? So, like... I don't know if this I don't know if the results are gonna get any better under Trident because Trident are not to the level that they are in Formula Three, you know? They're slightly getting better in that regard. Um probably was a little bit ballooned by the fact they had Richard Vershaw in there last year, but still we we know Vershaw is a very safe pair of hands in an F two car. So we know what that Trident is capable of. My question is, can Novelak and Stanek replicate those performances? And you'd have to say with how long it took them to get to the stages that they're at right now and just their apparent just inability to to sort of harness the sort of the hype and all that stuff. Like it's, it's a very weird situation talking about these drivers. Because you know, everything goes back to TRS for me. Hmm. But I remember I first watched Novelak drive here in TRS and it didn't take him long before he was proving his speed. It's like, oh, okay, okay. It's a good driver, good speed, all that good stuff. Yeah, sweet. Um, and he sort of floundered for a couple of years. He sort of disappeared out of sight. Then he went to F3 and it's just like, okay, this is not what I was expecting. So I don't know. It's a bit of a bigger leap up um going to formula two than it is going from trs to formula three so yeah um <clears throat> i don't know i'd say either one of those drivers will be lucky to crack the top 10 this year in the standings uh but who knows i'm maybe proven wrong a very difficult one to call um tyler maybe you've got different different thoughts on this i i'll echo what i said to start with it's a solid like if you wanted to have, if you're a team manager, you wanted to have some drivers you think they'll pick up points and they're probably not going to bin it all the time, but you might struggle to get wins. I think this is the exact line that we go for. Is that a harsh assessment? No, I don't think it's harsh at all. Um, I mean, it's a pretty cutthroat business. And if you're going to score points, I'd say that you're not doing a bad job by any means. Uh, I'd say it's the sort of lineup that PHM could have done with this year. Um Novelak has had a very difficult last 12 months, probably one of the most difficult uh, for a driver that's in F2 this year. Um, and yet he moves team probably in a way that ironically is for his betterment, uh, despite the fact that he's leaving the team's champions and, you know, the car where you realistically anyone jumping into F2 wants to be going to Trident. I think that will help him. He'll feel more comfortable, more at home. He did well there in F3, right? Yeah, exactly. I uh, finished, I think it was third without a win, which is sort of Fittipaldi-esque and also a, quite an achievement if you think about it. Um, but since, yeah, since coming to F2, he's just not been able to figure it out. Uh, I asked him last year so many times uh, what was the reason why he just couldn't get it together that he just stopped replying to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I think Novak, he's got, he's one of the most followed drivers in F2, which is interesting considering the fact that he had the season that he did last year. Usually drivers like that sort of tend to have, uh, I don't know, enough ability or, or never have those sort of struggles. Uh, Novelak's going through an interesting sort of arc at the moment. Um, and I think a lot of people have written him off. So for him, I wish that he 
is able to get it together this year. I think he'll finish around 10th, maybe just outside the top 10. Um, I think he's the sort of driver who will get sprint race victories and maybe a feature race podium here or there. Uh, I think he'll be better with Trident, but I don't think he'll reach the potential of those around him who also went from F3 to F2, like Vesti and Hauger at the same time he did. I think th- he's unfortunately falling back a bit compared to those guys. Um, and then Stanek, it took him three years to get comfortable in F3. No, nothing wrong with taking a few years to get comfortable in F in F2. Um, if if neither of them are generational talents, then you know, you've know got to enjoy F2 as much as you can and put yourself in the best possible position in the future and that's what both of them are doing at the moment so you know fair play to them fair enough um yeah i don't think they're going to finish bottom of the championship standings a team this is um i don't think they're going to challenge for the title uh but trident did win the opening race of the year last year sprint race in bahrain so maybe if they're if if, the, if a trident does win the sprint race then something's going on scripted <laughs> Now, the driver that did win that opening race is now racing for Van Amersfoort for 2023. Uh, Richard Vishore, that is. And he's joined by Combat King J.M. Correa, who... Yes. Yeah, who everybody likes. It's a it's a great story. Um, but uh, Van Amersfoort, you said earlier, Tyler, they are a team that are serious. And I think that yeah. is kind of highlighted by the driver pairing. Josh, Richard for sure, solid driver, win, capable of wins, probably will get a win, I think, or two this year with Van Amersfoort. Career the same, maybe not the driver that's going to make it to F1, but still a solid driver. This is probably the better version of the Trident lineup, I'd say, that these are the drivers you think, I want some podiums this year, I want maybe some silverware. This is the driver lineup you'd, you'd pick. What do you think? Yeah, solid lineup. Like, um, and especially, I think the thing with Korea that is probably more on everyone's lips is just that it's an amazing story. Mm. And to get back into the category, into that car after obviously what happened in 2019, um, uh, it's a great story. And I'm just glad for him that it's all happened. I do wish him the best, but. Vershaw is in that other seat, and I rate Vershaw. Like he's uh he's a peddler, that guy. And it's I don't for the life of me understand why uh he left, was dropped by Red Bull, whatever went on there. Um it sort of didn't make any sense to me then. I'd love to know what happened, but in any case, um here he is today. VAR, um Van Amis Fort, if we want to, if if I don't want to give PTSD to any football fans out there, um, <laughs> like he's uh, you know, like uh, that 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 team did much better last year than I thought they would. Mm. They looked solid for a brand new outfit in Formula Two, um, and I think they played it smart. You know, they they bought in Jake Hughes, and he's an exceptionally good driver. That guy, um taught them everything that they needed to know got got them up and running uh as well as they could toward the end Cordial was up there thanks to the engine but still all the same it was a team that was doing better in that first season than what a lot of other teams would have done and they're continuing that sort of philosophy of having a driver with experience in there the experience and speed as well like, that's a good driver to have in there. That's a commodity. Like That's someone who, if I wanted experience in the team, it would either be Hughes or Vershaw for, uh, for certain. So, yeah, it's a good, solid lineup. It's a solid team with good history, very successful. They're serious about this. So I'm excited to see how they do this year. Um Probably finishing in terms of the teams about mid packish, something like that. Which for a second season team is a brilliant effort, I'd say. So, yeah, let's see how they go. For sure, is as Josh says, solid, solid talent. Um, I feel that this lineup or this pairing, should I say, with Van Amersfoort, uh, you know, we talked about the Frenchness with, with ART. Um, not to push JM aside, but Dutch team, Dutch driver, Dutch people speak English better than English people anyway. So 
it's a solid, solid lineup here. How high can Van Amersfoort, VAR, for sure, Correa, top names in feeder series, how far can they rise this year? Are you asking me how high a Dutch team can get? <laughs> very clever, mate. I like that. That's, uh, that's very snappy. Thank you. Thank you. In all seriousness, um, oh, I love I love Van Amersfoort. I, I just think they're a quintessential junior series team. Um, and yeah, they, they've they certainly upgraded, I think, their driver lineup. Um, I think JM is someone who will never be, I think, as good as he w- could have been pre-accident. I think he had a decent rookie showing when he was in F2 uh, back in 2019. Um, I think he's the sort of driver who could like sneak a sprint race podium, but I don't think that he'll be able to um, fight as, as much as maybe we'd like to, but he's going to have so much support behind him this year and fans will be cheering him the whole way for every point he scores. Um, for sure, he's never had that opportunity to fully spread his wings. This is it. This is a chance. This is the chance that someone like Boshong or, you know, other drivers who sort of stay around hoping that they'll get that seat eventually. This is what he's been waiting for. He's never had that security. And Josh, you said earlier about, you know, about the Red Bull situation with Vishore. Um, and the reason I know of, at least, I'm, don't please don't take me this for fact, but the reason I heard of was that Vishore himself made the decision to leave Red Bull um, because he didn't want the pressure to do, you know, of, of dealing with that, which, I mean, when you compare the amount of other, you know, the six Red Bull drivers that are on the grid at the moment for F2, you know, you can understand that. Um, I mean, where, where, Josh, do you roughly think Vishore could finish in terms of sort of best, you know, if the VAR package is consistently good all year and Vishore is able to get it together, could he breach like a top five maybe? Yeah, yeah. Top, if if, if uh, Van Amsfoort can give a package that could help him vie for the top, not necessarily hand him it, but help him vie for it, mm. top five easy. I, yeah. I definitely think he's that caliber of driver. Yeah, I, I think I completely agree. I've got him sitting sixth around Behrman and Vesti, which I think shows, you know, he. I think neither myself nor Josh consider Vashore to be a sort of, I don't know, I don't know what the right phrase would be, but sort of a, a second tier driver within Formula 2. He's he's not um, sort of a best of the rest. You know, he he's a sort of, he's up there in terms of he has the ability to prove himself. Um I mean, you never know. People, you could argue that Vashore and Drogovic have had a sort of um, an almost somewhat similar first couple of seasons. So, what's to stop Vashore from just going on and doing what Drogovic did? No one really, I mean, not that many people expected Drogovic to even be in contention last year. And, you know, you never know. I hope it'll be lovely to get a, a F2 story like that, you know, Van Amersfoort winning, you know, in another Dutch team after MP Motorsport last year. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think that Van Amersfoort are in good hands and um, whether it's Vashore or Correa achieving glory, both of them are, in my opinion, massively um, underrated and uh, I'm excited for them this year. That's for sure. That's for sure with Vashore. Very good. Um, let's see how high they can go. I always find it curious with Vashore and Boshong to an extent are these drivers who are probably more 70% businessmen than... 30% driver having to self-fund these championships, unlike hmm. some drivers who, not say you have it handed to them on a plate, but they can focus solely on racing because their management or their parents are sorting out sponsorship and getting hmm. the seats, whereas Bashaw's a self-made man, Bashaw's a self-made man, and I do wonder how much how much time and effort could have be spent improving as a driver in the sim, on test days, etc. Hmm. if these drivers had another 5 million thrown at them five years ago can I, can I just say it's sort of on, on that point I just wanted to ask Josh his feelings on that as well you know I know that I don't want to make this into some sort of running gag or anything but um you know what is their aim here <laughs> I feel like for sure is and the reason why I don't think Josh has said that in the last 10 minutes is because I think we both and correct me if I'm wrong here Josh but we both feel like Vashore is teetering on the we both think that there is a world where he could actually make something if he has a really good season this year. I mean, if the likes of Fittipaldi can get picked up by Red Bull for the season he had last year, why can't we sure have a better season and do something about it, you know, this year? Um, I think, yeah, sorry. I don't know, like, um, 
it's difficult. I would like there to be a chance for him potentially to get a, a shot at Formula One, but I think that's probably a bit too far, maybe. I think that ship has perhaps come and gone, unfortunately, but mm. I think the reason why I never brought the question of why is he still there up is because I'm assuming that he's sort of taking on more than just simply a driver role at Van Amersport. Hmm. He's part of the package that's helping alleviate that team to greater heights. I'm you know, just theorizing here. I could be wrong, but uh, you know, like what would Daravala bring to Prima, for example, hmm. to make them a better team? I can't really answer that. But what could Vershaw bring to Van Amersfoort to make them better? There's a few answers that you can throw into there. So there is a bit more purpose, I guess, you know, um, for Vershaw being in there for another year. Um, but also, you know, compared to Nasani and Boshong, respectively, um, in Boshong's case, but especially toward Nasani, you know, with Nasani, you don't think there's much in the way of hope. Whereas on the opposite end with Vershaw, it's just like, you don't mind seeing this guy in there. I think the, yeah, I, I, think, sure. I, I think the likes of a drug of it, I think you were alluding to is nobody thought he'd be potentially making his F1 debut in Bahrain 12 months ago, like upcoming now. So if Vershaw did a yeah. top three in the championship, is that going to be the same case? Yeah, I mean, well, the thing is, is that Vashore, um, you know, he's, he's had a decent season with Trident. I think he's made people think, he's made people want to see what he's capable of in what Van Amersfoort are showing they have at the moment. And if they can keep that up for the whole season, which is what they need to do, then Vashore has what he needs to show that. Um, I think Correa is a massive factor in the team. And I think he won't score that many points in my opinion, but I think he will have a massive impact because of the experience that he's has gained on his, uh, you know, sort of recovery back through the ladder. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to talk about it because obviously it's such a, a sort of painful subject for motorsport fans and, and F2, uh, the F2 community. But I feel that since the accident, um, people have sort of, the, the, I know that the journey back almost has seemed like it's taken so long that I don't think it has quite the shock value and the factor that I think he deserves so much applause um, because considering the extent of the injuries, it's quite easy to forget that, you know, he, he was on the receiving of some pretty horrendous, you know, some of the worst stuff I've sort of read about from his perspective. Um, and to just be, you know, have that courage to come back. And, you know, I, I, I know that Josh has, you know, done stuff on Nicky Lauder in the past and it's just like it makes you realize that you know that sort of stuff is still around you know he is sort of the modern version of that in our eyes so yeah we wish him all the best and and I hope that he can also help lead um their team to to further pastures in the future and you know I think Van Amersfoort will become a a title contending team in the next five years Good shout, Tyler. Uh, if anybody has never or hasn't yet listened to the podcast we had, the ART special back end of last year, really good listen. And you get a proper sense that Correa is such a mature driver who knows his fortune, most specifically, and is happy in the position he's in from everything he's gone through. Probably you can't argue something like that is going to change your perspective on life. And I would not be surprised if he knows he probably isn't going to beat for sure this year, but what a team player this guy is, which is why I think in sports car, he's going to do extremely well. Endurance yeah. racing is a suit this guy to a T. So make the comeback, see where he goes. Final team though. And the kind of top and tail with the two likely championship antagonists from how people are speaking. You might want to throw Iwasa and Hauger in there as well, but Virtuosi yeah, have... <laughs> exactly. Virtuosi have Amory Cordiel, the one and only. Some Australian who's dumber than a box of rocks called Jack Dewan. I think that's what you said, uh, right, Josh? That these guys, um, Porsche and Dewan, are what people are saying are likely to be the championship punch-up. Um... 
Dewan showed a lot. I showed a lot of people up, including a certain Kiwi on here last year. That guy was quick, like really quick. And <laughs> if you're not watching, Josh is trying to hide his face a little bit there. And with Virtuosi, with that consistency, with a team that clearly he seems to perform well at, I don't see why he can't go into this season as maybe not the title favourite, but certainly one of the title favourites, Josh. What do you think? Rodeo. <laughs> yeah. Do I have to talk about the guy? You talk about <laughs> whoever you want. This is this is uh, the virtuosi segment. I can take the cordial bit if you if you feel like you want to. I'll make it short and sweet. Not too bad. Not on Doan's level. Won't be anywhere near him. As for Doan, um, rapid dude, prove me, prove me wrong for sure. He's he certainly came down on me like a box of rocks. That's for sure. As did has won that place. Nah, he's he's rapid for sure. Um, and he proved that over the season in his race pace as well was very very good. In fact, I think I was there with. Who won the feet? Who won the feature race in Spa? You were there, wasn't was there, mate? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that was his first maiden feature race win, and I was there in person to watch him do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, he's 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 a quick dude. He you know he'll get results. I'm predicting about third or fourth this year in the standings. That'll give him the 40 points with a super license, which means Alpine will give him a Formula One seat in uh, in 2038. <laughs> so exciting times for him. Can I point out that it seems almost forgotten, it's because of the Piastri fiasco, that Alpine have brought two drivers to F1, just not to Alpine in recent mm. years with Joe and with Piastri. Mm. I don't see the space for where Dewan might make it, but could be Dewan be, I don't know, joining Williams or something next year, Tyler? He's, well, he's, I don't know. Like, Do you really reckon Gasly and Ocon are going to survive with <laughs> each other? Like, there is a chance that there may be a French Civil War breakout within the confines of Alpine and maybe go on their separate ways. And there you go. Voila, door opens. Who knows, Tyler? Your thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, what, I don't, yeah. what we're going to see from these from the, both both drivers. I think Josh was very cleverly um, avoiding some some words on his teammate, but Dewan isn't the only driver for, for Virtuosi. What do you think we're going to be looking at for, the, for this team this year? Uh, I don't know who to, who to start with. Really, I mean, it's um, it's sort of it's an interesting. Uh, teammates lineup it's one of the most odd on the grid um you've got a driver in doing who i think could be the quickest on the entire grid um and i think that when you look at the top of f2 he is i think most people's pick for the championship i think josh said earlier that paul share was his pick for the title if i'm correct um, where would you place Dewan compared to Porsche? I thought third or fourth in the okay. championships and like that. So I think the top three, a uh, top three, four will involve Porsche, Hauger, and Dewan. Who the hell did I pick as the other one? I think it was Behrman, I think. Okay. Something or like Wasser that. or something like that, maybe. Mm, uh, I think, yeah, it might have been Behrman instead of a Wasser. Okay. So yeah, I think. So, so what's this the thing for me is is what, and I'm interested if your answer would be the same as mine on this. What is the main reason that Dewan won't win the championship? Mexico. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to give a. No, similar I mean, like, I think. Um, no, I just sometimes fortunes just don't go your way. Like that's uh, the yeah. thing that I try and stress is like. We talk about doing speed and it's there for sure, but I'm sort of banking on like things aren't gonna fall his way completely. Um, you know, so it's not about doubting his ability, it's just about guessing, like totally guessing who's gonna have better fortune over the season. So that's really what it all boils down to is just 
yeah, the law of averages may not favor him this season. Yeah, I, I think that's. Yeah, I sorry, I was just going to say, I think that's like the the probably the biggest thing to worry about from Duan's perspective is that um, there were things last year that would make you feel there could be a few rounds where he goes scoreless. Um, and that's the thing you can't do as a champion. We saw it with Porsche last year. You have one band round and if a driver has a drug bitch like season, you get punished straight away. And with the amount of quality there is at the top of the grid for the upcoming season, um, you know, I'm sure that Hauger will nick 25 points off doing if he doesn't want them. I'm sure that Porsche will do the same. I'm sure that Behrman, you know, I mean, we could go on and on. We've spoke about it, but um, Duan's my pick for the title. Um, I just feel that he's just, I just think he's just quick. And I think that he will eventually make up for the mistakes that he had last year in terms of starting from the front and not bumping into people in the first 30 seconds of each race. Um, I think he's so excitable to just have a have a dominant season that I think it's bound to come. It's bound to come. Um my 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 worry is virtuosi. Um I think the last time they had a driver this good, obviously they had Grand New Joe and, and and the likes. Joe didn't win the title. Uh, they had Luca Giotto, another good driver, never won the title. I just worry that Virtuosi are one of those teams, sort of like high tech where Calamila? You know, well. well, yeah, I mean that's the thing they just don't seem to just have that last bit to clinch it. And I worry that something as stupid as, I don't know, using the wrong tires at a pit stop or whatever will cost him. And, um, you know, he had a, a few of those sort of issues last year and yeah, it's difficult to call. It's really difficult. Sometimes it just happens, but I think doing is my pick for the drivers this year to just go in and start strong. I mean, he got pole, on his debut of the rookie season, I know he competed uh, a couple of rounds uh, in the previous year of F2, right? Yeah, but, um... but yeah, the opening round of his debut or you know of his rookie season, he got pole in the first race in Bahrain, which is yeah, it's it's a perfect sign. Um, so if he can be as strong in qualifying again, and we saw it with Piastri, if you are strong in qualifying in F2 and can just deal with the first lap, often that's enough to just dominate a season. Um, and everything sort of falls in place from then on. Um, just Amri Cordil to finish off the entire grid. Well, I wrote a note down saying that I feel that Cordil drives quicker on public roads than he does on track. Um, but in all seriousness, Cordil has actually improved. Um, and I have him just outside the top 10, which I don't think is a bad performance. That's sort of comparative to the likes of Boshong. Um, like compared to the likes of the Shaw last or you know the year just gone, uh, I think Cordell is actually quite a good partner for Doing. Last thing I'll say is I spoke to Doing I think just into the second half of last year about how difficult it was to effectively be leading the team on your own <laughs> and to not have a good reference next to you. And people might say, well, Drogovic had Novelak who didn't you know didn't wasn't comparative. The difference was that Drogovic had two years. He had two years extra. Yeah, this is his third year. You don't need to worry about having a good teammate next to you when you've had the experience in the past. Whereas Doohan came straight in after, you know, fighting with Halga for the title in F3. Um, and it was really difficult for him to just know exactly whether he was getting the most out of the car. And it was difficult to tell. And with all respect to Marino Sato, Cordiel is going to be a better teammate for Doohan. And I think something as simple as that, having a, a reference next to you could set you up for you know for for what's to come and, and I think that could be a title. Excellent points, Tyler. See why you have that F2 editor role. Um I think the most pertinent thing from what you said, and I can apply it to about 10 drivers on this grid, is not why or how could they become the champion. It's why wouldn't they become the champion? Um you, hmm. you asked Josh. And I think the key thing for that is for everybody is because there's another nine odd drivers who are just as good as that driver. This is Josh. I'll let you have the final thoughts on this. This is shaping up to be at this very early point of the season, a championship with about a dozen top drivers. Didn't we say that last year? <laughs> 
I don't want another season like last year where it was decided before the final round. Like we all want to see good, good close racing. And that's what I think is my main thing at the end of the day is like, yeah, I said Porsche was going to win the title and that so-and-so is going to get two race wins. This guy's going to finish 14th. That guy's going to finish second at the end of the day. What we want to see is close battle. Um, you know, and there's enough drivers in that field to make that possible, provided everything goes in order. But yeah, I'll I'll keep um I'll keep my optimism in check until the green flag drops in Bahrain. Uh because yeah. You never know how the season may play out. You don't. Um it's going to be a, it looks like it's going to be a really good season. And we all hope here that it is going to be a really good season. It's no um, odd decisions to have three races per weekend and all these other little bits and pieces that we saw a couple of years ago. Really good rookies pushing out some of the drivers who've been there for a few years. A real change. So despite what you said there, Josh, I think it's time to be positive um and i'll let you will i will let you have that final word so if you've made it this long congratulations that's uh, another mammoth episode one day josh will join to talk about f2 f3 or something and it won't go over an hour but i, I don't know when that day will be tyler massive round of applause to you i mean what's the time now um half past four in the morning yeah best thanks thanks to thanks to my boy monster uh, not sponsored, unfortunately, but I'm not drinking a Red Bull, so that's out the window. <laughs> I'm going to call it there. Thank you to everybody for watching, listening, everything. Um, like, comment, subscribe, all that usual stuff. Josh, obviously, has a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to, and we... <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, who, who, who'd have thought that? Have how, thought many subscribe, that? how many subscribers is that got now, Josh? Man, I don't know. 350,000, uh, something yeah. like that. Just a 350,000 odd. Just, you know, <laughs> your, your classic micro nation. Just, you know, stand <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, just exactly. like, yeah, just like Lithuania or something. I don't know. Yeah, def micro Lithuania oh, definitely has more than that. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that's all the time we have this week. Thank you for watching and listening. We are going to be doing the podcast all year long. Some terrific guests that we've already got lined up for you. Some of the top drivers from F2, F3, Freca. So if you want to hear from more of that, like, comment, subscribe, all the usual stuff. If you are listening on podcasts, leaving a rating or review will be greatly appreciated. Um, if you aren't already, please follow Feeder underscore series on Twitter, FS Americas on Twitter, and Feeder Series Now on Twitter. Uh, you can find the links to those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself, Josh, and Tyler. Um, keeping you up there, Josh, that big yawn. Uh, in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time. We have been the Feeder Series Podcast. Goodbye.